Hello and welcome to the Wormhole Podcast, episode 62. I'm Charlie Place and joining me today is the author of Portrait of a Thief. Released at the start of April, it went straight to the bestseller lists and a year before its release in 2021, it was bought by Netflix for adaptations. It's pretty cool. We'll talk about that in due course. For now, hello, Grace D. Lee. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to be here today and to talk all things books. That's, that's excellent. And we're going to spoil the book, which is brilliant because I really enjoyed this book. It surpassed my expectations. It was brilliant. You are studying medicine. How do you combine your medical studies with your writing? Yeah, so that is a great question. And I think I am also still figuring out the perfect balance. But right now, I am currently writing full time, at least for the next month or so, because in the US, most med schools take about four years to finish, but most students at Stanford take five or more because they're getting another degree, doing research, and I convinced them to let me write for a year. And so I am coming up on the end of that, and I am starting my rotations in the hospital this June. So luckily, I have a little bit more time before things really pick up for me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can I ask what's your specific interest in medicine? Have you got a specific interest? Yeah, I am still very open. I think that I probably prefer a medical specialty to surgery just because I think I probably prefer talking to people than cutting them open. But <laughs> I am generally open. I'm excited to learn more once I'm actually in the hospital. And I think a lot of my friends have said that once you actually start your rotations, all of your preconceived notions about what you want ends up going out the window. So I'm excited for that. <laughs> oh, wonderful. So on a, on a different subject, but I think it's something you do now. And it will see into our a conversation about the book proper. Am I right? You are a museum tour guide. <laughs> yes, I am a tour guide at Stanford's Art Museum. So that is a lot of fun. So fun and so logistically useful to be able to walk around the museums and check out how the art is placed and the kind of security, that sort of thing. So I would always walk around with my little tour guide badge and try not to look suspicious as I'm scoping everything out. So, so we need to point out here that Grace is not going to do a heist or rob any museum. She just knows the facts and stuff. Yes, yes. No, no plans for art theft in my life. <laughs> so if I give the readers what I hope is a brief intro to the book. So Portrait of a Thief focuses on a group of five Chinese-American university students and they become a close-knit group. One of them witnesses the theft of Chinese art from the Sackler Museum, which in turn, uh, in time, leads to our five characters being offered $50 million to lift Chinese art from five different museums for the CEO of a big Chinese company. Uh, it's to get stolen artefacts back to China. So this book features some heists, but most importantly, I think as a reader, it looks at the issue of art repatriation and questions about Chinese American identity. Grace, I think, should we start with your reading? That might be a good way to start. Yes, that is the perfect way to start because I am reading from the very beginning of the book. Our first character, Will, witnesses a heist. State your name for the record, please. This was how things began. Boston on the cusp of fall, the Sackler Museum robbed of 23 pieces of priceless Chinese art. Even in the museum's back room, Dust catching the slant of golden late afternoon light, Will could hear the sirens. They sounded like a promise. Will Chen. And what were you doing at the Sackler Museum, Mr. Chen? I work here part-time. I'm an art history student at Harvard. Did you see anything unusual before the theft? No. Describe what you saw during the incident. Any distinguishing features of the thieves, anything the security cameras might not have caught. It all happened very fast. I looked up from my essay and the alarms were going off. When I ran into the gallery, they were already leaving. They had on ski masks, black clothes. He hesitated just for a moment. I think they were speaking Chinese. For a moment, the only sound was the scratch of the detective's pen against his notepad. I see. Do you speak Chinese, Mr. Chen? Yes, I, does it matter? I couldn't really make out what they were saying. 
The alarms are going off at this point. Of course. And do you know what they stole? Will thought back to the empty room. If he closed his eyes, he could fit the pieces back where they were supposed to go. A pair of jade tigers, a dragon vase. A jade cup with three crested bronze birds, mid-flight. Not really. I've been gone all summer. The detective slid a sheet of paper across the table. Can you read the title of this for me? It was a printout from the Harvard Crimson from late August. Will swallowed hard. What is ours is not ours. Chinese art and Western imperialism. Did you write this? Yes. The detective leaned forward, his fingertips touching. Tell me if this sounds suspicious to you. A Chinese student writes an article about looted art, and a few weeks later, Harvard's largest collection of Asian art is robbed. All the priceless pieces mentioned in the article, gone. Will leaned back in his chair. The golden light made everything feel like a painting, and he let his mind drift for a moment, thinking of the paper on Renaissance art that was due next week, the sculpture he still had to finish for his portfolio. Not particularly. And why is that? I was born in the US, Detective. Will looked for a badge, a name, Myers. Detective Myers, was your, I'm Chinese American, Will said, lingering on the American. He adjusted the rolled up cuff of his button down, imagining how his sister would handle this situation. You said I was Chinese, but I was born and raised in the US, just like you, and I work part-time at the Sackler. And three weeks ago, the Crimson published a paper I wrote for an art history class at Harvard. Last time I checked, none of those are crimes. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have homework to do. This is procedure, Mr. Chen. I just have a few more questions, if you will. Will Rose. It might have been a small thing to be called Chinese instead of Chinese American, to have this detective who spoke in a Boston accent look at him as if this place, this museum, this art didn't belong to him. But it didn't feel like a small thing. Not when he was at Harvard, this place of dreams, and he was so close to everything he had ever wanted. It was his senior year, and the whole world felt on the verge of cracking open. I've told you everything I know, he said, and I know my rights. Next time you want to accuse me of something, go through my lawyer. In Elliot House, with his window open to the warm evening air and the distant sound of chatter in the courtyard, Will took a single jade tiger out of his pocket. Thank you. So... I hadn't heard of the story before, but I read all the facts behind your story. I was fascinated to find out that, you know, obviously we've got the issue of repatriation, which is a very real issue, but the actual heists are a real thing almost. Can you tell us about the true stories behind your heists? And I know you've you've used a real company name as well. Yes. So this is a really interesting story. Because several years ago, I read a couple articles about the real life thefts, and they immediately caught my attention just because they were so unexpected, but also they felt a little personal since I'm Chinese American, my parents were born and raised in China. And so the story is that several years ago, Chinese art began disappearing from Western museums. And so there was a series of heists and no one knew who was behind it, but all the pieces of art that were getting stolen had previously been looted from China's old summer palace, which was ransacked by British and French forces in the 1800s. And so there's a lot of speculation about who's behind it, you know, maybe the Chinese government, maybe private individuals, but I thought it would be a really fun story if the thieves weren't expert criminals, but Chinese American students who had never pulled something like this off, but were figuring it out as they went along. So you were kind of thinking straight away about the fun nature of it then and what you could bring to the book in that way. Yeah, I think it was a couple things together. And one was, I thought it would be really interesting and a way to talk about my own identity and how I've come to terms with that. But I also have been thinking much more in recent years, and especially as it's entered the more general public consciousness about the repatriation of looted art. And it seemed like these heists were particularly interesting because there was 
what seemed to be a clearly defined purpose behind them. It wasn't looting, it wasn't stealing this art just for the sake of stealing it for, for money. There seemed to be a clear purpose in targeting this art that had once been looted from China. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it's maybe worth uh, noting that if anyone else is sitting here and thinking, how do I not know about this? It hasn't really been publicised. A lot of museums haven't said anything because of the the cultural and the political situation behind it and everything. The whole thing of where the art that is in the different museums originally came from, are you able to give us a brief history of this time, The I think it's the 1860s, the Second Opium War and the looting? Yeah, so basically the... Old Summer Palace was constructed many, many centuries ago, and it was for many the jewel of China in that it was a royal palace. It had all this beautiful art from many different dynasties. And then in the 1860s, British and French forces came and burned it to the ground during the Second Opium War, and they looted the art there and what they couldn't loot, they burned the rest and it took about three days. And so currently in Beijing, the site of the old summer palace is still there. It's never been rebuilt because it serves as a reminder, I think, to the Chinese people of all the culture and history that has been lost over there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's interesting to note also that something that, that is a part of it is the person who said let's get rid of the place that the British guy was actually Lord Elgin's son, I think. But yeah, that that was just something that was like, hmm, okay, you know, it's a a thing here. Are you able to talk about what's currently happening in terms of art being given back or the discussions they're in, the changes that have happened since the heist that you wrote about? Yeah, so this has been really interesting because to provide some context to our listeners, in recent years, the repatriation of art has become a really talked about topic. And so we have currently, I think the conversation is happening around the Benin bronzes and returning those. We have a lot of conversations about will or they won't they about the Elgin marbles. I think a lot more people are really aware of and pushing for the return of art that has been sitting in these museums for many, many years, but no one has ever talked about returning them or has considered returning them, at least from the end of the museums that are keeping them. And so I've been watching this and I think I've been, I've been pleased to see the developments and hopeful that there will be more to come. Mm-hmm. I think the Elgin Marbles are here, aren't they? They, they should definitely go back. Um, I'm of one accord with you. I think it needs to happen. <laughs> Um, But you touched there on your own identity. Can I ask you about that, how you've thought about your own identity and how that has happened as a process, how you feel within that, if that makes sense? Yeah, definitely. I would love to talk about that because when I think about this book, I often think of it as an identity story disguised as a heist story. And it has so many of my feelings about growing up Chinese American, I think like many children of immigrants who grew up here, I often got questions about where I was from. I got compliments on my English. I felt like I could never really be American enough. And then when I visited my family in China, I would also get questions over there that I now know were very well-meaning about whether I could speak Chinese, whether I could use chopsticks, but put together, it made me feel Like I never had a place in either China or America. And it took me many years to process those feelings and to find acceptance with my own identity. And a lot of that transition came in my university years and after. And so I wanted to put a part of that process and that growth within the book. Well, you've got these five characters and we'll try and we'll try and talk about each of them on identity where do they come into it in terms of you creating them as characters and and their different explorations if I can ask how you created them and and stuff in that context yeah absolutely 
I think for me, part of what I wanted to capture, while also knowing that it's impossible to capture the full breadth of it, is just the diversity of the Chinese American diaspora because there are so many of us and all of our experiences vary widely based on geography, on our parents' background, on our own experiences with identity. And so we have Will and Irene who grew up in the Bay Area and visit their family in China often. And then we have Lily who grew up in a small town in Texas and never learned to speak Chinese, has never gone back to China. We have Alex, whose family have lived in the United States and in New York City, Chinatown for many years. And then we have Daniel, who immigrated here when he was 10 and still feels very close to his childhood home of Beijing. And you have told your book, with each of the characters getting a narrative, you move between them. Was this always in your mind to do once you had come up with the idea and the concept? Were you always going to give them each their own narrative? I think so. I think that's how the book came to life for me. But it also was very difficult just because it was my first time writing multiple points of view. And so writing just the first, I think, five or so chapters took me about a year and a half because (laughs) I was trying to understand each of the characters to create their own distinct narrative voice and just to figure out how they would all come together in this heist. Something that I highlighted, and I wonder if you can talk about more, you've got a theme of loss in terms of the identity. And the bit that I highlighted was going to China, those few summers that he did, and I believe we're talking about Will here, yes, Mm -hmm. um, was the only time he felt found. Loss was the hesitation in his voice when he spoke his mother tongue, the myths he did not know, a childhood that felt so vast and alien from his parents that he did not know how to cross it. Obviously, this is Will, but also we've got Daniel, who's been born in China. Are you able to talk about more about this, about the characters themselves in this theme, if that's not too broad a question? <laughs> yeah, I love that you highlighted that sentence because it is probably one of the the most personal sentences in the book in that it is... Will's perspective, but also I think it encapsulates a lot of my own feelings, both growing up and now, in that I, like Will and his sister Irene, I visit my family in China every few summers. And every time I'm there, I feel both this sense of belonging and also this sense of loss, because I'm surrounded by these people that I share blood with, but also there is so much about their lives that I don't know. So many of our experiences are so different. Visiting my parents' childhood homes, it really makes me think about just how different my own life is from them and how I don't know if I'll ever be able to fully understand what their experience of growing up was like. That's interesting to hear. Why are heist to explore identity? Um, I think that This book has a lot of everything that I love. And so I wanted to talk about identity and the repatriation of art and art as power. But also I grew up really loving heist movies. And my siblings and I would watch all the Oceans movies, the Fast and Furious movies. We'd get into arguments, debates about who we would be and what role we play in a heist. And so I really put everything that I love in this book. I finished writing it during the pandemic. And so my attitude was really, you know, I don't know if anyone else will ever read this, but I want to write something that will bring me a bit of joy and happiness and hope during this time. Mm -hmm. And so I found everything that I like to think about and to talk about, and I put it in a book. I did love that you had the fast paced nature of the heist but it wasn't always the heist that was making the book fast paced. But you you mentioned the pandemic there and you've mm-hmm. mentioned it in the book as in the past. And I know you, you've been writing this during the pandemic. Is this novel looking at a fictional future? You know, where in our current day does the novel fit? Yeah, so I finished writing the first draft in summer of 2020. And so I was hopeful that the pandemic would end sooner um, 
than we are now. But the book really imagines a future that I was hoping for at the time that I was writing it. I ended up actually mapping out the timeline because the characters are university students. So obviously there's an academic schedule to follow. And I think that the book, if it were to happen in real life would take place in this upcoming academic year. So 2022 to 2023, during which Will and the other characters would be you know, seniors or juniors and all of that would be taking place in reality if it were to play out like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, I, I had an idea of when you'd, you'd written the book, but I did think it was interesting when it kind of occurred to me, oh, hang on, you know, she would she'd written this during lockdown. I'm going to ask a lot of the details in this heist. You've got a lot of security that goes on. And obviously, Alex has worked out things. She doesn't necessarily believe that she can do it, but she obviously can. But then they, they do things that you wonder, oh, you know, is that maybe less secure or something? Was there a reason for the different levels of kind of encryption, I suppose you could say? Yeah, so I think that part of it was wanting to be realistic when thinking about the levels of security in museums. And part of it was the fact that they are college students. So for a lot of situations, they are just going with what they know. One of the interesting things that I discovered in my research, though, because I ended up reading a lot of nonfiction art theft books, is that museum security actually is not as advanced as I think a layperson like you or me may believe, just because museums are really meant to let people in as opposed to keep people out. And so being able to circumvent security The tricky thing there is not getting in, it's getting out, which is something that the characters also end up talking about. But again, I am am no museum theft expert. And so I'm sure that there are plenty of limitations in the book that are due to my own knowledge about museums and just doing the best that I could with my own research and my reading. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm you've got Daniel's relationship with his father included here, which is just absolutely fascinating because the father is, he's works for the FBI for arts crime and he's specifically looking at Chinese art. I thought, how on earth is this going to work? But also just fantastic. (laughs) I, I suppose the question I want to ask is why have Daniel's father be so high up? You know, what, why was his role important? Yeah. So I wanted this, book to be a story about family, both, you know, the found family of the crew coming together, but also children and their relationships with their parents. And so when I set out writing it, at first, I, I mean, I knew that there had to be an FBI agent chasing them. And then I couldn't really get much further with that. And I was stuck on it for a while. And eventually I realized it was because that felt very impersonal. And then I thought, what would make things much worse for this situation? And I realized that something I wanted to talk about and to think about in the book was the characters getting chased by an FBI agent, which is very common among all heist stories, but also to have the prospect of getting caught be more meaningful than just getting caught and thrown in jail, which is already pretty terrifying, but also the fear of disappointing your parents. <laughs> well, did you ever have any concerns kind of writing wise about having Daniel's father keep quiet as he does? Hmm. That's a great question. I think that Daniel's father and his decisions developed pretty naturally in writing the book because When I started writing their relationship, something that I realized was that there is a lot of love between the two of them that they don't really talk about. And so Daniel doesn't know that his father loves him so much and would always choose him. But us as the reader from the outside, I think that it's a little clearer that for Daniel's father, his son is his priority. And so I wanted to to build up to that, where we have that moment where it feels like all is lost. But 
it's also not too much of a surprise that Daniel's father, ultimately, when he's weighing his job and his responsibilities versus his son, he he ends up choosing his son, who is his only family here and the one that he loves most in the world. And then getting to deconstruct Daniel's own reaction around that and his feelings of failure and disappointment. Those were all very challenging chapters for me to write, but also very rewarding ones. Mm-hmm. I think there was a potential in it where I was like, oh gosh, you know, is, is this going to work? But the way you did it, it did. I could see just from a little bit of research on you on, on the book, the ways that your characters have come to be and the different inspirations from your own life maybe. Do you have a favourite character, one that speaks to you most? Oh, that is a hard question. I love all of them because, you know, obviously they're all a little bit of me, but I realize that's a cop-out answer. So let me think of a real answer, which is, I mean, I think it would probably have to be Will because, you know, the story starts and ends with him, but also he's, he's this very complicated and at times frustrating character, but I think a lot of his fears and his ambitions and him not really wanting to pursue art despite how much he loves it because he thinks that if he gives it everything and he still fails at it, then who will he be? Like all, all of those feelings about, about art and his love for it really parallel, I think, my own relationship with writing. And so he has a special place in my heart. <laughs> well, I've enjoyed that answer. I also like that you said, hang on, this is a cop out answer. I'm going to give that that's the best <laughs> answer I think I've ever had. So someone going, hang on a minute, I'm going to give you an even better answer. Yes, thank you. No, that's great. I think the romances, I like them, but I couldn't decide myself as a reader, I couldn't work out how much they were like, uh, imperative to the story or not. Can I ask you, how do the romances, obviously in, in your mind as the writer, help the story's message and topics be brought to the fore? How important are they, etc.? Ooh, this is an interesting question. This is the first time I've gotten this question. So forgive me if my answer is not to put together. I think everyone has been I'm so wary of spoilers that they haven't talked about it. For me, I think the romances were really about giving the characters a more complete understanding of themselves. And so we have Will and Lily and Will really learning to be okay with accepting himself. And I guess because Will's big arc is being afraid of things that last. He thinks that he can only ever do temporary because he loves art so much, but he knows that that will never last either, or so he thinks. And so his relationship with Lily is really him dismantling that belief. And you know, likewise, we have Lily who has spent her whole life searching for somewhere to call home and worrying that she'll never get it. And then she finds this crew and and will she develop this relationship, she's finally a bit more comfortable with who she is. And then, of course, we have Irene and Alex, where they both you know, have all these hidden insecurities, and then the other one brings them to light, where Irene has her own journey of never really being honest or open with herself, except that she is with Alex. And then Alex is worried about never being good enough. And then here's Irene who makes her feel that way, but also has always believed that she is capable of more than what she is. And so all of that to say, I think that the characters and the relationships that they develop with each other was a way for me to have the characters figure out themselves a little more but also just because they're university students and part of, I think, the university experience is you know, for many people just making mistakes and 
falling in love or falling out of love and just all the, the complicated relationships, romantic or not, that you get into with everyone around you. That's a good answer. I didn't see Alex and Irene coming at all. I think you did a good job at the start of kind of establishing Alex's friendship with Will mm-hmm. enough that I think throughout the book, I know I was thinking, well, it seems like he's going to get with Lily, but there's still this thing with Alex. But you did do a good job of, of making that quite hidden. So the ending, had you always planned it to be that Will would write the article and so forth, this kind of different heist? That was there from very early on. I plotted out the entire book while I was struggling with those first few chapters because I knew when I started writing it that I was not smart enough to pull off a heist by myself. And so I knew that I had to have a plan going in. Otherwise they would get to the end and then nothing would happen. They would fail because... I could not conceive of how they would get out of whatever situation I would write them in. So I, I knew I had to have it planned out beforehand. And I also knew that as they were college students, it didn't seem all too realistic or surprising in a fun way for them to just you know, successfully pull off every single heist and then go on their merry way. Because a lot of the, the fun and the surprise and the joy that I get from heist movies is as we're approaching the end, knowing that everything is about to go wrong and then everything does go wrong and then you don't see a path forward and then suddenly there is a path forward and all the, the clues to it have kind of been there all along. And so most of it was planned out. And I think that the details, the, the small bits of everything coming together, some of them were surprises for me too. Well, I was reading it on Kobo, so probably about two thirds to maybe even a little bit of a halfway through after you've had the second heist. Mm -hmm. And then they start talking about finishing. And I'm like, well, hang on, there's quite a lot of of pages here remaining. (laughs) How's Grace going to do this? And then it got to a place where they were starting to talk about another heist. And and then I was thinking, well, there's too few pages here. How are you going to do this? (laughs) Had you ever considered having more like full heists as such? Oh, I played around with it. I think the the tricky thing for me was I wanted to base what I could of the book in real life. And so in real life, seven of the Zodiac heads are in China and five are missing. And so I put the five Zodiac heads that in real life, no one knows where they are in all these different museums. And then I thought, you know, most books or movies, they they do one heist in the course of the whole story. And so how on earth am I gonna have my characters do five? That's way too many. And I would also have to think of new ways for them to pull off all five. And then I started trying to think, okay, well, how many is a reasonable number? And I thought, you know, like having them do this three times, it seems okay. But <laughs> also they need to, to get the payout, they need to succeed. And I think ultimately, one of the big reasons why I wrote the ending the way I did was I wanted to think about museums making the decision to give the art back. And yes, you know, they're facing all this public pressure, but I didn't want it to just be a story of of these characters stealing it back and believing it was right personally, but then that's it. There's no larger shift in the world because obviously My hope is that all this looted art will be returned. And so I wanted to imagine this future where countries are able to make this decision on their own, even if they have to get pushed there by robberies. Yeah, no, I I like that you did have that strong message at the end. I have to say, if you had done five heists, I totally believe that was possible. (laughs) So... (laughs) Could the characters have found who they were within the novel, obviously, without the heists? Hmm. Oh, I love this question. I think, yes, it might have taken them a bit longer. And I say yes, just because, you know, as a Chinese American myself and with 
many friends who are part of the Chinese diaspora and the Asian diaspora, all of us at different points in our lives have come to terms with our identity, found a place that we're comfortable you know, existing. And none of us have done international art crime. So yes, I think that the characters in the book would have figured out who they are eventually. Um, it might have taken them a bit longer. I think doing something like a heist that is so transforming, that's so transformative, pushed them along. And I think in a way that I really enjoyed writing about. So the book before it was released, as as we said in the intro, it was bought by Netflix or optioned for Netflix. Has there been any progress with this? Um. So there has been some progress with it. I'm not sure how much I am allowed to share publicly. I will say that I was recently in LA and I did get to meet my Netflix team. And there are a lot of cool things in the works. Um, They did have me sign a lot of paperwork earlier, so... I'm not sure how much I should disclose. That's that's fine. I'm I'm making lots of excited ooh faces here. It's, <laughs> it's, that's that's cool, and I think that's uh, yeah that that's happening. Then definitely that that is exciting. So okay, uh, what's next in terms of books? So I am working on something new. It is still in the very early stages, but it's set here at Stanford, at Stanford Med. And so if I get my way, we're going to get some familiar cameos with the characters that we know from Portrait of a Thief. We're also going to get some new faces. It's about two longtime academic rivals who are forced to work together and don't quite like it very much. How fantastic. So, So we're bringing back some characters and seeing them again. Mm-hmm. Oh, fantastic fantastic that that is exciting as well so grace it's been wonderful having you here today i think my excitement has probably shown from my voice i hope it has this book has been wonderful it was really exciting when i first came across it and i was thinking that this is just something that's very different it's got little bits Links to purchase has been portrait of a thief done are in the episode in description ways, and you have managed to if you have enjoyed today's discussion unique, do subscribe thank or you follow for the podcast and on your listening app of choice thank you so much the for the podcast this episode 62 was recorded on the 5th of may and published on the 13th of june 2022 music and production by charlie place